Uh, my name is Jessica Harry. I'm the uh, executive director of the ICA, and I'm just really excited to welcome you to this ICA Lunch and Learn session. Um, it's a guided practice on the work Blush by Jean An, and I'm thrilled to introduce to you um, Wan Kak Kim. Um, this piece was dedicated to him, and we'll be able to hear a wonderful performance, um, a video performance that he did in just a bit. Um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about the best way to work on this piece, especially if you are going to be participating in the ICA's Young Artist Competition. Deadline is coming up on April 1st, so this will be a good primer for that if you're going to record and submit, and I hope you will. Um, I'll share the link for information on the competition if you or students that you are teaching um, that are eligible would like uh, to enter that competition. Um, a little bit about our presenter today. Um, Wonkak is a, a teacher of clarinet at the University of Oregon. And as I mentioned, the piece that you're going to hear today is one that was written and performed by him, or written oh. for and performed by him. So um, he's going to be a really great source of information for you. Um, Wonkak is an Axos recording artist. He's garnered international acclaim through his uh, extensive discography. He's the associate professor of clarinet at the University of Oregon and a performing artist and clinician for Buffet, Crompon, Silverstein, and Van Doren. I would like to introduce to you Wonkak Kim, and I'm going to turn my camera off. We will have some time at the end of the session for questions, so please keep those um, in mind as we are working, and feel free to type them in the chat as you think of them. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's an honor for me to be here. I'm excited to share my experience uh, learning this piece and, and performing it. Uh, this uh, blush for solo clarinet was actually kind of revised work from uh, Jinan's earlier work for oboe. Um, I think um, Jean told me back in 2018 that it was never performed, maybe read a few times and sat in her desk drawer for, for 10 years. And then when I approached her about, um, you know, having her write a piece for me, she uh, thought about this piece and kind of readapted it for me. So you might see that uh, timeline is 2010 slash uh, 2019. So that's sort of the genesis of, of, of the work. Um, for me personally, I've always been really interested in uh, getting more works by Korean composers. That's where my heritage is. I just, just uh, my, have this experience back in college when I uh, first came you know, to the US, I, I went to high school here and went to college, decided to study music and was going through the big stack in the library and, and found a work by Lee Sang Yoon, who really is a major composer. Um, and it was just such a thrill to see like how this actually exists. Um, but, you know, that was one exception almost. There's not a whole lot around, um, especially uh, clarinet music. So as I started my early career, my goal was to get to know some great composers, young composers, and, and have the pieces written for me. Another inspiration was seeing all my friends with a different background. I've seen some uh, Balkan and Bulgarian uh, players who just would improvise on their traditional theme, and it just sounds amazing, so natural. And people with klezmer background, I mean, you know, we all play klezmer to some degree, but it just seems so incredible and, and intuitive. And I was really always jealous about that. So what if I, you know, explore my own heritage and kind of build upon it? So that was the idea. And this piece really was one of the first uh, pieces that I've played. And since then, 2018, I've commissioned and performed at least a dozen new works for smaller ensemble clarinet or clarinet and piano. Um, a lot of that will be recorded on my upcoming CD in March, actually, uh, in a couple of weeks. So, um, I hope uh, I get to share that with everybody and people are interested in exploring this music. So going back to Blush, um, when I first got the music, it, it was a little daunting because, you know, it's uh, the notationally it looked actually pretty simple. Um, there are some variations, but the guidelines are fairly minimal. So and I, I tend to not listen to the MIDI realization when I learn a piece. Um, when I study a very complicated chamber music, I listen for, for the ensemble. But in this case, solo, I, I try to conceive the sound from the score rather than getting the computer uh, realization. So it's trying to sort of imagine the sound, how it would go. And to my surprise, I was able to draw a lot of uh, the sound that I was already familiar from just listening to the music, uh, traditional Korean music. So I don't have any background in traditional Korean music. There's actually, it's a very serious discipline. Um, there's, you know, just really incredible uh, musicians and people who pursue that uh, discipline. There's an academic degree all the way up to doctorate uh, in many Korean universities. 
uh, but I had zero. The only thing I got was, you know, just general music classes in, in grade school when I grew up in Korea. Uh, but also I realized I listened to a lot of these music in the background, like uh, TVs, uh, commercials, or just movies, any jingles that, that would be played. So all, all these sounds and rhythm and just the, the, the contour and, you know, the shape of music is sort of coming back to me. But that, that was already inside me. So I think that was the, the most exciting part, being able to draw from that um, and sort of, you know, have the music, musical score and see how that connects with the, the deep down sort of built uh, uh, musical examples and, and all the, uh, the sound that I heard growing up. So again, since then, I've actually started studying, listening to more actual Korean traditional music uh, performances and uh, a lot of uh, you know, um, you know, convergence of, of what I felt versus the new information that I actually learned. So again, that's that's really um, good part. Um, I'll mention one more thing before we listen to the uh, the video performance that I produce uh, is that um, this these works to to me is it's not um, imitation. So what it is is you know trying to play Korean traditional music on clarinet or play like a traditional melody on our instrument. I think those are fairly simple dimensional. A lot of that has been done too. But what I was hoping to do was the actual fusion of uh, those kind of very different music, musical style and possibilities, and then really make it, fuse it with what we have in, in our Western contemporary music. Because I, I am, my training is in Western contemporary music, Western clarinet, so that's my specialty. So I don't want to try to play the traditional music on clarinet. I mean, that can be done on the traditional instrument, but uh, by really sort of drawing the, the, the possibilities and potentials from, from those different background, we create something really remarkable. And I'm still playing the clarinet, a very much kind of Western um, uh, classical music that I'm used to. So that, that's been an eye-opening experience. And as a result, what I try to avoid is just trying to follow, let's say it's a vibrato or, you know, certain styles or certain sound. Um, I can maybe use a lot softer read and make it more closer to the sound of like Korean Piri, for example. But I kind of stayed against it. I, I was, my approach was like, learn this as I would learn Stravinsky three pieces, like our standard repertoire. But then uh, find a way to still, uh, you know, find a tangent and, and convergence with those ideas. And um, it's some of that is difficult to express in words. And but I, I'm going to try to do that in, in some ways. It's, it's to do with phrasing, the pacing, and just the way that we, we, be, we, uh, we are aware of the kind of sound development, just um, a lot of sort of details in a smaller uh, plane. Uh, the, the, the line and the, the importance of sort of horizontal line as opposed to vertical, like harmonic structure is tremendously important in, in Korean um, style. And I think this piece really sort of builds upon that. A lot of the smaller motifs, the rhythmic motifs, and then longer lines. So um, the, the way that we paste that and the way we sort of develop a note, a single line of, of note uh, is quite different. And um, so before, we, before I talk too much about um, all the other extra stuff, Let's listen to the music. Um, I believe some of you may have already listened, but it'd be good to kind of refresh our memory, my memory for that of timing, and then um, talk about it a little bit more.
Thank you, Jessica, for playing that. I hope uh, that was a something to enjoy <laughs> rather than be stressed out. Um, so I think uh, Jessica asked me to talk a little bit about the the, the venue that I played. It's a uh, wing of Korean gallery at our art museum at the University of, uh, University of Oregon. And um, th that's another reason that I was so happy here uh, when I came here six years ago, I found out there's a actually sizable Korean art collection. Uh, there's actually a Japanese art collection too and sort of dedicated gallery to, to those cultures. So just really nice uh, places to visit. Um, but then I, I thought, you know, maybe I can perform and play in those spaces. So they happen to have this exhibition called, um, I forget the exact title, but it's a reinterpretation of contemporary ceramics. And uh, Korean pottery is, is very uh, old tradition. I mean, it goes back a couple thousand years and some really beautiful works. Um, many of these artists stemming from the tradition they're adapting the Western techniques and Western sort of forms and shapes. And as you may have seen in the middle uh, part of the, the gallery was, was sort of the future the exhibits of the contemporary Korean ceramicist making on that sort of building upon the tradition. So some looks very much like old uh, Korean traditional uh, arts, some look uh, completely Western. And I think that's sort of the, the idea behind this musical fusion, it almost kind of uh, visual representation of what I'm trying to do. So it was just a, a coincidence that that happened at the same time, but I was really happy that the, the video sort of encompassed both visual and the audible uh, sonic elements of that cultural fusion. And um, again, just to reiterate, my intention is not one to take over the other, but just really uh, to, to create something really nice using both cultures and um, just expand the possibilities of what we can do. Uh, both as players, as, as composers, or, or artists. So, um, oh yeah, thank you, Jessica, for, uh, for the title. Um, so we got some time, and I, I think um, I'd like to elaborate a little bit on, on the piece and uh, go through some specific points, and hopefully I can articulate what I uh, was trying to do musically. And this is with the intention of helping uh, students who are studying this piece for the competition or just uh, trying to learn it. Like I said, at first, for me too, it was it was kind of daunting, like how to um, to make sense of it. To Of course, we can all play the notes. Um, it's not, I think, not terribly difficult, any of these, but to, to find a comprehensive sort of plan and uh, stay engaged through every sort of uh, uh, structure and every bar, every um, statement. So, um, let me uh, see if I can share the score. It's been a long time since I did this. So. All right, is the uh, score shared, Jessica? Yep. Excellent. <clears throat> so I have some annotations here. This was mainly for myself, actually I uh, have Few different versions. Uh, this one it was for for the video that I sh uh, shot, and I'm recording this again uh, in a couple of weeks, so um, it's for my own reference. Um, I use these little brackets to kind of organize uh, the the musical statements or phrases, really, um, because they they don't always align with the bar lines, um, you know, like most music we play. But in this particular piece, I think it's so important to completely ignore bar line. Um, as long as you can, you, uh, you learn it well enough to you can count without mistake. Um, also try to just destroy any sense of pulsation or, or sort of uh, vertical uh, hindrances so it can create the, the longer line. Um, I think the challenge is being able to sort of stay accurate to the rhythm, but still be able to do that. That's, that's the biggest uh, challenge. So you can see like some of those lines that I expressed here. Um, Another thing I did was to identify sort of those rhythmic motifs. And you can hear two different uh, rhythmic motifs here. One is what we start with, you know. That's sort of a reverse dotted rhythm. And then we also have sort of uh, the opposite right here at measure 17, right here. So this sort of um, long note followed by the short. And they're all mostly built around the note D, or I guess C, in a concert pitch. And the, the idea of center tone 
it's sort of like tonic in Western uh, musical system. But th this is sort of the notes that everything is the, the key or the, the pitch that everything is focused on. And you'll see this coming back uh, each time. And it's something to hang on to both to the player and the listeners. So the more we can sort of uh, deliberately sort of show that to, to, to the listeners. So right here at measure 17, I'll, I'll play some examples of, of this, this particular motif, the second um, long short uh, motif. But you can see that this is actually the second statement is elongated with lots of disruptions. It's the same idea. We have. Okay. So that, that was at least my interpretation, and uh, Jinan was not very much against it, so I think she's happy. Um, by the way, Jin told me repeatedly when I invited her to come maybe contribute a little bit to the session talk, is that the player should feel absolutely free um, to do whatever they feel from, from the music, as long as, of course, you can be convinced and you can justify your own interpretation. So um, even with this, uh, the things that I say, I would not say this is the only way obviously uh, this is my personal interpretation but uh really based on sort of my uh background and uh some of the research that i did so we have that at 17 let's see if we can find some more of the the similar ideas um so we we're talking about long short so here again it uh, comes back <laughs> And then it uh, kind of tap tapers down, um, representing sort of the end, end of our first uh, section. A um, few more places I can kind of highlight. Even here, it's, uh, it's a little difficult to see because of notation, but if you look carefully, it actually is. So before we move on to this moving, uh, moving part, you can, you, we see actually two uh, similar statements and this this continues on as you can see all, all of these sort of long short on D so I think you, you have to uh, not just go through them but really sort of separate them and, and make a you know reiterate their importance and then a few more examples um, I guess the at the very end again this is another way a reason that this is very significant how the piece concludes is that um, the final kind of statement of this this rhythmic motif. Oh, I'm sorry. This is actually the the other one. It's a reversed rhythm, um, but again, it's it's very related, and I think you can see uh, the the relationship. So as opposed to here, and then you know um, this is actually the rhythm from the very beginning. By the way, you see. So that's one thing I'll mention about the that repeated uh, rhythmic motif. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is um, again the placement of the the phrases and phrase might be a little different uh, word to express. I, I think like maybe a statement or phrase or or unit. Um, the way that they're placed in the beginning, like right here, the uh, measure four through five. And here's another one, by the way, you can see that at the end of this phrase. So it's followed by our first kind of lyrical phrase, followed by the, the same long short rhythm. Um, when we go to this measure uh, 14, 15, we have this little pickup followed by another this long short rhythm. But I'd like to place all of them as much tied together as possible. So if you literally read this off, it, it may end up being something like. I think that that doesn't quite um, express what the composer wants to develop from from this line. So I think good way to learn this is just maybe ignore some of the um the lines or even the rhythm and sort of like feel that movement of the the note groups and then add in the um the the slurring and and the rhythm and it 
contains both the gracefulness and, and the longer line that we have. Um, oh, and I think some people had a question about these uh, double flat. Um, I, I interpreted at first um, as a kind of quarter tone. Um, and I think that's sort of what uh, Jean Allen was thinking. I try to have a very specific fingerings and asked, asked her, do you like this pitch better or this pitch better? And she actually didn't care. She said, just play E flat um, instead. But what, what we want is a little bit of kind of blurring between these two notes. It's a little slide. So I'm, I don't know if I can play that, but. So there's actually a little bit of a slide both up and down. And then also here from C uh, up to the D flat. I use the side key, uh, that type of sound. So, um, I, and other option was I had a very specific quarter tone fingering again, I, I can't remember. And she didn't like that as much. It's more rigid and, and sort of, you know, quarter tony. So I think that kind of natural inflection up and down is what the composer is looking for. Um, oh, this, this is, I think, uh, one of the really exciting parts to me. Um, when you listen to uh, Eastern traditional music, and this, this is true both in Chinese, Korean, and I think maybe even Japanese traditional music, the, there's a concept of uh, stillness and the turbulence that, that ensues the stillness and kind of settles it down. And that sort of expresses all of the, the cycles of life. And here Jin An asked for alternate finger to rotate. So rather than you know, this kind of heavily rhythmic march like figure, I think what we're doing is starting the distortion using kind of contemporary technique or um, alternate fingering. And then it, it comes down into piano, but then she adds molto vibrato and throughout these measures I utilize a few different uh, ways to vibrate to add intensity and then finally settle on something uh, more stable so it's all the same note here starting on the A. And I'm using, oh no, I got a little chime here that, that will ring 10 times. So I'll just take a little my throat break. Should have turned that off before, but here we go. So the idea is to find the fingering that makes the most difference. And I, I used the uh, uh, third um, right finger. So we have And that's um, from then on, I make more variations and I start to vibrato. So what I do on this A is I learned this from some uh, Korean period players is that they actually kind of re uh, um, disturb the air by kind of blowing through who 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 so that's what I did first and I gradually switch it to a diaphragmic vibrato and then I add lip drop vibrato and I start the the intensity by using lots of lip so in the end we'll have something like So that was a little bit too much, I think, for, for the context, but it's all about how you can build it up. So I think if the process becomes sort of uh, gradual and, and well proportionally paced, then th that is a su successful uh, multi vibrato. So I, I personally like that. And I use that technique again here. Um, there's a high F trill. So, you know, I, I used a at first and Jean thought that was a little bit too edgy and piercing and I, I agreed. Um, so instead we change it to a vibrato. So I guess you can really do either, but I, I, I start um, using the, um, the air again, followed by diaphragm and the lip. So we have. Something like that. And that sound is actually very familiar if you've li watched some uh, Eastern kind of, you know, movies or um, Chinese or Korean movies. I think you've heard, you may have heard that that type of sound or, or musical line. So it's like, ah, oh, that, that actually makes sense. Um, right here on the sort of 
uh, repeated notes, I found that when, when I use the tongue, it, it just becomes really edgy again. So um, I, I don't tongue, I just slur it, but it sounds like I'm tonguing. Oh, there. <laughs> along that line let's see anything else that um, oh and I think that generally the the whole piece is under that slow pulsating uh, tempo primo but we do have the middle section that kind of pushes forward and I think it's more than the tempo difference is the character so I'm trying to find the um, poco uh, animato. I think that's so. I, I to to me the the piece is more continuous, but I, I have a fairly strong uh, bar line that I place in here in the animato until we get to um, this uh, a tempo right here. So the way that I express it is I haven't really measured the, the metronomic tempo, but you can feel the difference. Um, starting from here. So it's still under that, that slow uh, motion, but here. Yeah, it's hard. I gotta, I gotta look at that a little bit. But you can see that I, I try to throw a little bit more kind of agitation, excitement, and there's more sort of a forward movement. And even then, I, I think it's not quite in 2-4. The way I distribute is... And it gets actually technically much easier to, to play. You can see that the organization and then you try to fit that into more uh, you know you can check with the metronome find a tempo that you like and then uh, try to align that that beat but if you read this off in, in exact 2-4 I think it becomes really unnatural and, and rigid I'll try see I don't know how it, that can even work so that sort of little guideline I think that I, I placed and you can sort of make your own version throughout this, this whole uh, section will make this a lot more playable, but also uh, musically um, salient. And let's see, oh, and there's a little, again, weird notation. And I thought it was kind of cool color. It, it is the quarter tone fingering that I'm using um, from G. Let's see what I do. <laughs> Oh yeah, so the idea is to shade the G-sharp as much as I can. So I use all of my right hand, including the B key. So, and it's a cool effect. So um, that's just something that, that uh, I think is a nice uh, color. Um, this long passage again, um, just think about holding this G for two full bars. I mean, it, it's so um, unmusical. So we got to do something here. And instead of using vibrato or any other sort of atypical means, I thought we can just pace this with our best sort of sound and, and sort of a bit of crescendo really, but the more, more of a growth of intensity. And then finally we add the turbulence using not vibrato, but the alternate key fingerings. So th I think that's another example of the cultural fusion where, you know, this could very well be something like this, in my opinion. But instead she chose um, like, you know, what sounds like the, the, the uh, atonal sort of, you know, 70s, 80s uh, serialist music kind of technique. So I think that that's to me it's a lot closer to the the 
Western contemporary language, but still really draws the inspiration from what I talked about, the Korean uh, traditional music. Um, Jinan wanted something more here. So she's like, what, what can we do? And I thought just, you know, not bound by this number, but just think about adding as much turbulence at the end as possible. So I just don't count this, but I, I put lots more, um, you know, So both with the articulation and I use the B key again for, for the maximum impact. Um, yeah, I think that's that's really all of the sort of unusual no notation or the, the phrases that needs to be watched um, with, you know, maybe a little outside thinking. But the rest of it, I, I think it's um, it's fairly straightforward in, in just notation and in the notes that we play. And I think that's the beauty of this piece. It's none of this is unplayable or, or too intimidating. I think it's very approachable. It's making sense of these and uh, bringing out sort of your inner uh, music with, with this group of notes. So my cautionary tale is um, not thinking with the metric sort of divisions once you understand the rhythm and then uh, try to play, sort of replace all those musical units in your head so that you're exploring the piece as, as a whole rather than all these little segmented, um, you know, uh, musical units. Um, I think that's all I have for um, just a brief overview. And I, I hope that was helpful. I think we have a little time, anybody, uh, in case anybody has a question, specific questions about, um, I don't know, anything, fingering, sound, um, tips, difficulties. You have some questions for Wonkuk about this piece. Please go ahead and type them in the chat. I'm going to start with a couple questions that I have prepared here. Um, I'm looking at measure 28 and again, right there at 44 where you just were and just um, suggestions from the D to G um, on fingering. Are you using <laughs> a one, yeah. three, one, three or one or something different? Yeah, I, I don't really have a suggestion. I, I think whatever that you, you is your best G, G uh, fingering that, um, that that you're comfortable. I use my standard G. Um, and I think that's more of a clarinet fundamental question. Like, so we think D to G is difficult. You know, it's a little, well, that's the, the harmonic series get a little messed up, right? D to G. But I, I don't, as a clarinet player, I think we should feel a great freedom moving through these. There shouldn't be any restraints. There's some of the work, you know, the daily exercise I do with my student is, you know, just the, the interval exercise of artissimo. So I use all of, except for the F sharp, I use a long F sharp in that instance, but it really helps us to not be stressed out about these, these upper intervals. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it shouldn't become a problem. So again i'm coming back to this nothing special about this i think we should, we should just practice this is a good opportunity to sort of kick that barrier in the upper artissimo uh, lower artissimo and and uh study the legato for that matter i think past g it's a bit problematic we, we can't quite connect as as easily you know like a and b so but i i think up to g and g sharp um we, we should be able to sort of treat them as as if they're um normal really so yeah my answer is the, the g that works the best for you and and just learn to really uh be uh fluent in in those uh, uh legatos in the upper register great uh i also am curious about the the niente markings and and how you would approach and just from a i'm from conversations with gene about this piece uh are some of these places where she has marked to niente intended to be emulation of ma, the concept that you talked about a little bit earlier of, of sort of the silence being as part of, of expression of just generally life. I'm just curious about how you would go about practicing those and pacing yourself in between those, like specifically there at 60, was it 68? Like how much time do you think is necessary sure. to really achieve that? Yes, I, no, I, that's a great question. And I, um, Jim, again, was very adamant about um, taking as much sort of freedom based on, you know, obviously genuine interpretation of music. So we can't just make things up. But there's a, such a great argument here that we don't want to rush through into the next bar. And it's actually kind of hard to do in context. I mean, you know, it's 
what I, that, that's the way that I interpret and also how I teach my students to do this, not just on this piece, but as players, it's, it's, so, it's, it's hard to stop ourselves. So I think <laughs> um, I didn't do that here, but I would put like a big marking to just finish this off completely and, and then take back. And um, to counter our sort of, you know, drive that's more of a reflexive, I, I think sort of tapping into the other opposite is always a good, uh, good way to break habit. So, for example, I mean, when you're practicing this, um, you know, you know, so that you, you it, it's even then, I don't think it was too much, but I, I, I think we should do a lot more than what we we're going to do in a practice so that you're, you're not um, thrown off by the extra kick of energy or excitement mm -hmm. in the performance. Um, I don't know if the, the sound is going through, by the way, the soft dynamic usually gets cut off, cut off. But yeah, I think we can really do beautiful stuff. There's no other instrument. We all know we can play very soft, explore that region. Th those are some of the best sound that we can produce. So um, I think it's really worth exploring that. I don't know if we have some others, but probably the same, uh, same answer. I still have some questions in the chat as well. Um, when picking a quarter tone fingering, how much is too much within regards to contextually for this piece specifically? You know, like I said, there, there isn't uh, too much, uh, too many of those. I mean, this is one thing that I, I see. I don't know what else I can do to make it even more. So here I'm, I'm making as much difference by pressing. If you have better fingering, by all means, I think it's, it's nice. Um, other quarter tone is maybe you're talking about these kind of double flat type of figure. It shouldn't be, I think, rigid. So sometimes when we do the quarter tone fingering, we get like, like all of this like very angular um, movement. Excuse me, I, I'm getting a little <coughs> congestion from <laughs> all the cold. But uh, here, it, sh it should be smooth and um, sort of the polar opposite of angular. So I, that, that's why I like to use almost a glissando-like figure. So that fingering, um, that type of quarter tone, which is by a half or quarter opening of the, uh, the key, is, is dangerous because it's not as reliable. But it's, it's perfect in these occasions because it, it shades the notes and, and connects one note to the other really smoothly. I think those are my choices. Um, other than that, oh, I guess, yeah, there are more, but usually they're followed by glees too. So, so I also use there from my regular F and I use the, the side key here. And what I do is I don't fully open it up. So just uh, press it maybe halfway or third way. And that, that has both achieved the glees and the, the sort of the end uh, quarter tone. So are you using lip to achieve the gliss um, in combination so, with somewhat, the fingering? Somewhat, yeah, okay. it's a combination with the fingering, but nothing, again, drastic. We're not, you know, doing the Rhapsody or, you know, <laughs> other stuff, yeah. Okay, uh, the next question, I'm asking about measure uh, nine and 111. So n measure nine, double flat E, and measure 111, yeah. a, a, uh, flat A. Uh huh. Yeah, th th those are the same question. I, I think that, that those are the most unclear. Maybe you should um, talk to Gene to maybe re-notate that. But um, the I I mostly just play the the E flat. Um, and again, I, I hope somebody finds a better way to do it. But the idea again is to to shade the note and have add a little bit of inflection. Something like that in a in a very quick su succession. And it's pretty fast, so I don't think there's anything that you know needs to be overthought. Basically, that that's that's the word I was trying to find, and that's exactly how Gina expressed it. It's not a big deal, essentially, but you can do something different here. It's almost like little glissando or some little uh, interruption. So it's not like a Brahms, but something a little bit. I can't really do it now, but. I hope you get the point and can do this better than I can demonstrate. Uh, we have a question. Um, any tips on the flutter tongue and measure 20 to 22? 
<laughs> so again, all the clarinet fundamental question, right? Yeah, right. Um, for me, fortunately, it works. Um, I, I think she says noisy, and it's a very disruptive note. So I think the the most amount of noise we can generate, and to me, that's by rolling the tongue, like, um, and when I do that, I, I realize when I teach students, I the success rate is never a hundred percent. There's some just it doesn't work physically, but if we have a lot of space in our mouth. the 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 idea is to be able to roll the tongue and form the embouchure at the same time. So if I roll the tongue on the backward of my mouth, like this, and then leave enough space out out here to still form an embouchure and blow, that's uh, that's how the mechanism works. Um, so I, I, I think, oh, here's another way to practice. I, I put my hand out and then I blow the air so that it's similar to like how I, I would play. But see if you can do that while rolling your tongue too. So that's how we we can you know vibrate the reed and make the sound. So the thing is, once you can do it, it's it's not that difficult. I mean, you can play the whole. You can play like. The problem is to just trigger that and, and stabilize the uh, the rolling and the, the embouchure. So that's something that you can practice. There's some other ways to generate the sound if that's not possible. It's just by crawling. And that is uh, the same concept that we disrupt the airflow, uh, like uh, in French. Uh, you get a little bit somewhat different uh, sound. I think it's a little bit more notice more noticeable if you roll the tongue here. I don't know if there are any other ways there may be, but just the idea with the flutter tongue is we disturb the air, you know, a constant rolling basis so that the sound, the resulting sound is what we hear. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I can elaborate there. And finally, what is the what is your opinion on the highest note possible? <laughs> right. I think you measure 90. Um, if it's too high, uh, this Jason says, if it's too high, it feels out of place for me. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that so much. It should send a like random, very high note, which these two I don't like very much. Um, I don't like random when I play. I want predictable. <laughs> but, you know, I think the the to the listener, it's random. So I think, you know, we, we um, for me personally, I'd like to control it. So I just play high C. Because that's uh, that kind of lines up with this bottom. It, it stays with, with the note. If I play different note, I, I tried some other stuff. I tried like super high G. I try to bite the reed uh, with the you know get like you know all of those sounds. But it didn't really. I didn't like them very much. Now I did play Gene on other uh, a chamber music piece before this, and that's how I got to know the uh, the composer. I forgot what it's called. Um, with my chamber group but yeah there's a a part that she specifically asked for extremely high note and i just took the mouthpiece down and did like you know all those things here i i think um i don't know you can experiment but i i just play the super high c the the altissimo c and then just to clarify it's that uh now nothing's working because i bit onto my um my read but it's an octave higher than this C. Yeah. Okay. If anyone does, if there are no more questions, I think we can leave it here. Um, again, if you are interested in entering the Young Artist Competition this year, um, the deadline is April 1st, and information is available on our website. I'll drop the link in the chat one more time. Um, I will be posting this recording up on YouTube. So if you joined us late, you can catch the first part um, and all of the links that we discussed will also be shared in the YouTube comments there. Um, my last question, one is, is are there any um, other cultural items such as art or poems or even some traditional music that you would recommend helping, you know, listening to or, or engaging with that would help give you a better, more informed performance? Yeah, um, I wish I did a little bit more kind of organization in that front. Uh, that's always my uh, my plan. At the moment, I don't have any specific sort of, you know, bibliography or, or list of things. I hope to get them together. Um, I 
plan on uh, investing a little bit more on on this. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of work, both with actually uh, traditional musicians, Korean musicians. So this uh, June, I'm doing another CD where all the new music that, that's written for me and Korean, Korean traditional instrumentalists are, are being performed, uh, curated. If you visit my um, my website, I think I posted some of the, um, the such collaborations and you can hear some cool Korean instruments um, there too. Um, I don't think it's a complete, but I'll, 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 I'll be keep posting. So if you follow me somehow on, on Facebook or YouTube, whatever um, means, I'll, I'm planning on sharing a lot more of those. Um, not quite in time for, for this competition, but again, if you're interested in, you know, exploring this new music. And I, I think it's really beyond this new music. What, what I uh, learned from controlling, say, the single note in, in different contours made me actually play Mozart concerto a little bit different in more unique way. Again, I'm not improvising on Mozart, I'm not adding vibrato or crazy stuff in it, but just like understanding the sound concept and how it kind of distributes uh, the, the sound in time, space. Um, I think that's why this is so powerful uh, experiment. It's not just for new music, like we, we go back to our, you know, more standard repertoire, some, some really old staples. And you, you just have an added perspective to, to that and all these additional skill sets to, to apply. So I do encourage everybody to, to explore, not just this, but I think the same goes for you know, any other cultural collaboration in, in Klasner or the Eastern European, just all kinds of stuff. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much everyone for coming and thank you so much Wonkok for, for this awesome presentation and please give our thanks to Jean on for this beautiful piece. Um, and we um, look forward to seeing you all in another Lunch and Learn coming soon. Don't forget next weekend on Saturday, we have Chloridoscope. It's a free event. There's information on the website if you'd like to attend and participate and we hope to see you there. Uh, take it easy, have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, bye.